very shiny person because he is he's not only an atmospheric, atmospheric chemist but a rector of the Panama University, so we are basically the guests of the Panama University. And he will be the first speaker and he will speak about the global climate change and some local consequences. And then Carlos Bogart will speak about the voting issues and all that we will we will lend in somewhere here in Kursek and, and here we will, we will speak about this uh, circular economy. You remember we had beautiful presentations from the students and we dealt with these issues and Tuesday ordered it. So I would like to ask Andrash. Yeah, thank you. Good afternoon everybody. My talk is about uh, global climate change, but I will focus on uh, more uh, local consequences because I have only 20 minutes and this is a very complex issue. And I wouldn't volunteer to, to discuss all the details within uh, such a short time. Uh, I will show you a, a table uh, that uh, contains uh, the composition of the atmosphere in a, in a weird perspective. You have rarely see uh, the composition of the atmosphere represented like this. This uh, shows the total amount of each uh, consti atmospheric constituents rather than the percentage composition that uh, you're probably uh, more familiar with. And you, I, I try to, to make uh, uh, units that are somehow digestible for you, but you can see that these are very huge numbers. So for example, nitrogen, you have four billion times billion metric tons of nitrogen in the atmosphere. So it's a huge system. But more in, which is more interesting is the, the last column that shows the change in percentage since uh, the industrial revolution. This is less than or, or hardly more than uh, 200, uh, 250 years. And you see the, the numbers in percentage that uh, Tremendous changes occurred within a few hundred years. Even the amount of oxygen in the atmosphere, which is huge, changed, uh, and, and this can be uh, detected by instrumental analysis. And also, there are there is another uh, component that uh, we lost: four percent of ozone, total ozone from the atmosphere, within 70 years. And these changes are really tremendous, uh, considering the vast amount of uh, compounds in the atmosphere. And I would say that these are geological scale changes that occurred within 250 years. But the normal time scale, time scale for such changes in, 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 in nature is about 15 to 30 million years. But here we see it. Uh, is happening uh, within a few, uh, few centuries. So this is really uh, a weird thing that you can uh, monitor yourself. So this is uh, very uh, frightening because atmosphere, the composition of the atmosphere is linked to the climate. Because those, many of these atmospheric constituents are active uh, in terms of uh, climate uh, uh, determination. So if they change, then we expect the climate also to change. But uh, just uh, I skip all the details how these atmospheric uh, changes uh, influence climate and I just jump to the consequences of all these changes that are happening. And the most uh, uh, obvious uh, change that is, uh, is uh, always in the media is that uh, the change in surface temperature. And uh, you, I just mentioned that the, the changes in atmospheric composition are geological scale changes. But the changes that we observe in time, in terms of, uh, for example, global mean temperature, is, is not geological time scale. It's just within a few hundred years. And this uh, figure shows the change in the last 50 years, only 50 years. The reference period is just uh, uh, just after the Second World War, that this 30-year uh, period between the 1951 and the 1980. And uh, the, 
the, the period to which we compare this, uh, this reference period is just uh, the last five years. And this color, color uh, map shows the, the change that happened during this uh, period in the surface mean temperatures. Uh, red means about four degrees change, yellow about two, and uh, blue is the slight reduction in temperature. So most of uh, the northern hemisphere, including the Arctic, is red, which means that four degrees in mean temperature, that was the change between these uh, two uh, periods. This is very fast change, much faster than ever expected. And this is due in part or largely to changes, these vast changes in atmospheric composition. Uh, but these uh, changes, as you see from the map, are not even around the globe. If uh, greenhouse effect is the only factor effect, uh, controlling uh, climate of the globe, then we would expect a more even change in temperature uh, during uh, the course of the time. But we see differences uh, coming uh, down from the north towards the equator. And this is because there are other factors than the greenhouse effects that uh, help modifying uh, the climate that we uh, experience. And these are related to ice. Because Earth is not a simple greenhouse like uh, you, you have uh, plants in, but a special greenhouse containing ice and containing water, a large body of water, in, in the form of the world ocean. So these behave differently as from, uh, from a simple greenhouse. If I uh, put uh, some water into my glass and put some uh, ice cubes into, the, into this glass, I expect the melting of the ice for the first time before any other change uh, happening in the glass. And this is what, happening, what is uh, happening in, in this system. So we, in fact, we observe change, very uh, tremendous uh, change of the ice cover, especially the sea ice, which is most vulnerable among all the ice uh, formation uh, on the globe. And within 30 years, this uh, uh, figure shows uh, a satellite image of the sea ice in September in uh, 1984 and uh, 2012, so less than 30 years. And we see 40% of reduction of sea ice between the two dates, which is tremendous. It means uh, several thousands of cubic kilometers of ice lost during this 33 uh, decades. And considering the thickness of ice, it was uh, about 4 meters uh, in the 80s, and now it's one and a half. So it just, we lost about three quarters of the total sea ice within 30 years. These are not geological changes, these are very fast changes, much faster than we can anticipate. And this is the result of the increased uh, energy received by the globe due to the enhanced greenhouse effect and also other factors, which I wouldn't uh, detail in my talk. And this is uh, the same in historical perspective. We can reconstruct the, uh, the sea ice extent around the Arctic. <coughs> we can uh, reconstruct it from geological uh, records, sediments and uh, uh, ice cores and uh, others. And you see a rather stable uh, sea ice extent over the time, over historical time, except the last 30 years when you see just a very sharp drop of the amount of ice, the extent of ice, more than 40% of the ice extent lost during a, uh, the last two decades. So this is very fast change. These are very fast changes. We observe. What are the consequences for those changes? Climate change is often seen as an exotic uh, phenomenon, which is interesting for some uh, remote islands over the Pacific, which will be lost or 
inundated by the elevated uh, uh, sea or ocean, or for example, polar bears will lose their, uh, lose their habitats uh, in the Arctic. So it's not interesting for most of us living the, at mid latitudes, which is not true. Because uh, ice, especially uh, it, it, near the Arctic, has very direct uh, teleconnection with, uh, with uh, weather systems uh, at mid latitudes. Most of the front, frontal systems originate in areas where ice is, is uh, abundant, where sea ice is, is uh, there. And these, these effects influence uh, the weather much, at much, uh, 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 most part of, of the globe, especially on the northern hemisphere. So we already, we are in the process of experiencing climate change Ourselves. It's not a future scenario that we will have five degrees hotter uh, 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 100 years from now, or we will have a meter or so higher sea level by the end of the century. It's not the issue. It is with us now. And just to illustrate that, I show you uh, data from the, the National Hungarian Met Meteorological Office or Service which measure temperature as normal uh, part of their weather forecasting system. And this is the number of heat waves recorded by their uh, observation, uh, observations over the past century. And you see that there were some episodic heat waves over most of the uh, uh, 20th century. There were, in each decade, there were a few days when the temperature went that high, and uh, it means that uh, mean temperature is, uh, daily mean temperature is about 27. It's really hot for, at least for us, maybe not for other <laughs> people, but for us it's, uh, it's rather hot. And we experienced such hot weather occasionally in the past, but now you can see the, the number, numbers referring to the decades, the past three decades, that we have uh, 35 of these heat waves. These are measurements, these are not forecasts. These are measurements, temperature, recorded temperature data. We have 35 in the last uh, decade of the 20th century. We have 51 of them in the first decade of the 21st century. And this, and this decade, which didn't end, which haven't hasn't ended yet because we have three more summer to to go. We have already 64. So this is something which uh, is more than uh, random. So it's a kind of tendency to become hotter. And it is very understandable. If you lose ice, you lose the power of air conditioner for the northern hemisphere and you get hotter in summer. So this is rather uh, clear. That uh, you have this uh, teleconnection uh, in, the, in the weather system of the northern hemisphere. So you have less ice, you have more heat waves. So this is, this is obvious. But what about cold spells or cold extremes, which uh, occasionally hit uh, part of the northern hemisphere? And the most uh, famous one was uh, uh, New Year's time in the eastern part of the U.S which was, uh, the temperature was down to minus 40 or something, and uh, Trump uh, immediately uh, tweeted that there is no climate change at all because it's so cold. But eventually, this is uh, also a kind of uh, consequence of these changes uh, in, uh, in, the, in the Northern Hemisphere, uh, namely that uh, the Arctic is warming much faster than the mid latitudes and the tropics, and the temperature differences re is redu being reduced. And which means that all these polar jets, uh, which are uh, determining the, uh, the geographical distribution of cold and hot weather, are just making uh, kind of turns, or, and just didn't do what they are expected to do. So it's, instead of staying high, uh, around the Arctic and keep all the cold, cold uh, 
inside the Arctic side circle, if they just go like this, and where they go down, they have very cold weather. When they go up, they have uh, warm weather. At the time when US was hit by the east, east uh, US was hit by the <coughs> cold extreme, the Arctic was 35 degrees warmer than normal. So it's just an exchange of hot and cold weather. It was not generally cold weather over the entire northern hemisphere. It was just the distribution that changed. And it was, it was a sad story for most of the eastern Florida and Georgia and other. Uh, they have uh, lost their orange uh, plants. And, uh, but uh, on the other hand, uh, the Arctic started to melt because there were plus 10 degrees at the time, at uh, New Year's time, uh, on, at, at, the, at the North Pole, where they expected to have minus 25. So it's just, uh, it's just uh, an exchange of cold and hot air between, uh, uh, between the uh, two sides of the, these polar, front, polar, polar jets, which are the consequence of this decreasing temperature difference between the Arctic and the mid latitude. So, uh, concluding uh, my talk is that climate change is not a kind of exotic thing for the future, it's with us. We already experienced it, these are only uh, measurement data, there were nothing for the future, it's just what has what have happened uh, until today. All, all the data are measurement data, not uh, any model results or forecast. And we have, uh, we, we can expect that this will continue, these trends will go on, and then we will have uh, more uh, changes, more uh, uh, abrupt changes in the future, which affects our everyday life. And uh, just to, to show the, some prospects for the future, uh, the ice extent is monitored by NASA, uh, for, uh, the geostationary satellite. They are just continuously monitoring the ice. And the blue line is this year, ice cover. And the, uh, all the rest are the previous years. Uh, satellite measurements, and we are just down, well down below uh, these, uh, these uh, measurements. We are losing ice at a very fast rate. So we expect to have uh, more of these extremes uh, in, in the coming decades, which we have, we need to adapt to. We cannot do much against this because these are huge processes. These are not uh, uh, within the reach of, of uh, mankind, it's just uh, outside. But we can um, just uh, uh, make plans to how to adapt to these changes which we cannot uh, prevent. So this is just a, a brief uh, overview of uh, what is happening on the globe and, what, and that uh, these are affecting our, our life already uh, for a few decades, and then uh, we expect that this will not end by by any time. So we, we need to to be aware of that, and we need to to be prepared for for adaptation. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for this very brief introduction because uh, you won't believe I am a civil engineer. At least it was important that it was said. I extremely enjoyed this morning's presentations, this look back to the past, how far things of 100 years, 70 years, the war, uh, the recent Velvet Revolution still uh, influence us and we grapple how to manage our societies. 
Then we had a presentation by Professor Granchet where we saw that everything which used to be in geological time scales accelerated. So we have to deal with it much earlier and much faster than we saw. And I'm still uh, um, hitting the same uh, course by saying that next to the climate change, we have also other uh, very imminent, very dangerous uh, trends which we have to deal with it. And this particular uh, uh, importance or a particular actuality of it that today the heads of European states are gathering in Brussels, if I'm not wrong, to discuss migration policy. And one part of my talk will refer to migration and the links of what is happening. So the title is the Europe in the Vortex of Change. This is the title of the uh, whole summer uh, school. And let's see it through a water. Uh, the talk is uh, 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 going to focus on two uh, geographical regions, the dry belt in the northern hemisphere and in Africa, and also discussing migration as a global phenomenon and its environmental signals. And at the very end, I am asking, what is at stake? What is at stake for Europe? What is at stake for MENA and Africa, mainly the northern uh, hemisphere, dry belt and Africa? And what is at stake for all of us? OK, this is a 100,000 year flashback. Not 100 years, but 100,000 years. And you see that we are uh, uh, just living in a period of, which is an anomaly in uh, geological terms. In the last 10, 12,000 years, climate was very generous to us and giving rise to human civilization as we know it now. But we saw also that migration is a steady feature of humans. We already had uh, migration tendencies back uh, 70, 90,000 years ago, and even so, these migratory waves, as done by foot and not by the help of smugglers, took 50,000 years, but people reached from Africa, Australia, and so forth. And these huge waves say that we actually have to live with migration in one way or other. However, it is, if, if it's an adaptation, it is probably one of the most painful adaptations, both who move and also where they arrive. What did happen in not only in this 12,000 years, or 100,000 years, but in the last century? And you see that not only, or rather, the climate change is a reflection of the acceleration, what some people call the human enterprise, especially since the Second World War. But the last century, we experienced a threefold increase of the world population. Water withdrawals uh, uh, increased sixfold. The cropland area almost doubled. The pasture almost disappeared. Tropical forest lost by 25%. And 40% of the runoff of the, from the continents are now uh, controlled by dams. It means that we really changed the last century the face of the world. <coughs> and there are two points which add to this uh, very rapid change. At the end of political bipolarity and economic ideological confrontation, which paralyzed the world but created a certain type of stability because none of them could run away with the ball. And the last point is the widespread availability and accessibility of information and telecommunication, which means we are having an open book, can be read by everyone. What are the main reasons of global change? And I put population growth and the very skewed age distribution in developing countries, many young people, in developed countries, many old people, and the consequent migration as probably the biggest challenge, which is not addressed by according to its importance. Climate change is very important, but the reason is population growth and the, and the human enterprise. And this is not addressed. Geopolitical changes, China, US, Russia, and the European Union. Russia is, again, it was more aggressive than come close to what it used to be. The US and the EU is looking for what to do, and China simply <coughs> announced that I'm a <coughs> and acting accordingly. Regional wars and emerging trade wars will be and are a problem we deal with. Trade of virtual water. We are keeping some parts of the population in countries where there is no water, there is no crops, 
through transfer of food in a form of virtual water, and we have obscene, obscene subsidies. When I'm thinking of uh, uh, energy crops, and that in Germany, which has the highest <coughs> yield for corn and, and maize in the world, maybe in some US uh, fields are a bit better, uh, and 20% of the agricultural land is used for energy <coughs> crops in Germany, then I'm questioning that what the hell we are doing when people, one billion roughly, are still going hungry to bed, and we are uh, growing uh, uh, crops for not even CO2 neutral fuel. Technological development and changes, and of course climate change, which we saw. And this is actually the reason. This super exponential growth of population in the last, uh, let's say, 100, 150 years. What are the realities of this year? And I added here only problems which affect more or less at least 1 billion people. And if you go through this list, I'm not reading it through because then we lose the time uh, limits, uh, you see it is 12 billion. It means there are double and triple calculations. But two groups, the subsistence farmers and the slum dwellers, are two different groups. This is already 2 billion people. So if you are very modest, you can say one third of the population in the world is living under conditions none of us in this room would ever like to see or experience. And this is basically unsustainable. You cannot have a earth where one third of the population is completely disenfranchised. Uh, it is more than 10 years old picture, so probably China bubble is a bit moved towards the right. It is the distribution of the wealth. And you see that uh, the wealthy corners of the world, rich Asia, Pacific, Australia, Japan, South Korea, Europe and North America, where the highest percentage of the rich people are to be found. China is escaping uh, the, the uh, most uh, uh, based, uh, poverty, but India, Africa and the rest of Asia are still having a huge number of people who may have access to, uh, uh, to telephones, uh, to information, but not access to other amenities of modern life. This is a dry belt in the northern hemisphere, huge area only in the old world. There is, of course, a similar uh, yellow uh, spots in US and uh, Mexico and the uh, Americas. And the southern dry belt is also existing, but as the land mass is red, uh, more in the northern hemisphere, the northern dry belt is much more pronounced. And if we look into the annual population growth, we see that actually the highest population increase in this dry belt and in sub-Saharan Africa. These are where people are being born and uh, basically looking into uh, be part of probably of this one third <coughs> of the population which I mentioned. If we look to Africa, which is probably the most neurologic as far as population growth is concerned, you see that back in 1980, Europe and Africa was about in parity as far as population is concerned. Now, uh, uh, Africa has two and a half times more people than in Europe. In 2050, it will be six times more. And by the end of this century, it is more than three billion people expected to be in Africa. There are many reasons, but even if all these numbers would be uh, pessimistic, which are unfortunately unlikely to be, the genie is out of the bottle. So these people will be there, and they are, there are questionnaire actions uh, uh, that more than 800 million people uh, calculated to say they would like to come to Europe. What did it mean to Africa? There are only 13 years between these two pictures, and this is Burkina Faso, a country in the savanna belt in West Africa, and endangered by climate change, by the move of the Sahara southward. But you see that in 13 years, more than doubled the area of uh, cropped area. So there is an enormous pressure from the population growth, from the uh, nutritional demands in this part of the world. And when we look into what are our water resources means, this is a very simple indicator. How many cubic meters storage space do you have per head in the different parts of the world? 
you see Ethiopia is the last one. Now the new dam, which is going to be operational maybe in one or two years' time, with 600, would increase this 43 cubic meter per person to 630. But still, South Africa and Ethiopia, the African continent, is by far the least equipped with water resources infrastructure to deal with the problems, with water problems uh, needed to uh, provide uh, nutrition, provide energy, and the Migration. Where are they from? Where are they heading? Who are the migrants and how many of them? These are the questions. Basically, these four questions are asked, whether they are formulated more politely, and the answers are not and frequently not scientific. And there is also not only a kind of uh, very uh, uh, dry uh, scientific analysis, there is politics, compassion, human solidarity, pay a decisive role, and as you see since the last uh, migration crisis in Europe in 2015, there is also a kind of weariness and a kind of disillusionment in all along place around. How many environmental motivated force and, uh, and uh, flying migrants are around? And of course, this is very difficult to uh, claim that they are all only environmentally uh, uh, motivated, but the numbers are staggering. And they are unfortunately very well fitting the numbers which have been predicted already more than 10 years ago. In 2017, the UN High Commissioner of Refugees reported that more than 65 million people are on the move, and this is the highest number ever recorded, including the Second World War. The huge uncertainties, this is probably the most important research area because this is happening. These are directly affecting people, people's livelihood, people's uh, aspirations, people's belief, and even physical security. Uh, <clears throat> the first phase of the migration is normally a rural exodus. And we committed a major mistake in the 70s, 80s, and 90s when rural development funding was decreased partially due to well-meant environmental NGOs in Western countries blaming the World Bank to giving money for irrigation and dam building. And this created a huge move towards the cities. There are two moves. Uh, one is which you people go to the cities because they are attractive, or people move to the city because they are desolate, uh, destitute in the rural area. And what is happening in Africa is the second type of migration. Africa is the fastest urbanizing continent without the pulling factors of industries, the pulling factor of vast creation in the cities. This is a political move, it's an it's a in, in, in internal migration. This picture is from Charlie Varush Martin, who was here more than two weeks ago, but it shows a fresh water, human water security, and where you see green, uh, blue color, this is everything is ordered, there are no people. Where it is green, then we have spent a lot of money to rectify the situation, and this is Japan, Korea, US, uh, rich parts of Latin America and Europe, where it's red and dark brown is the situation is bad, and where it's orange, it is getting worse. And the most important part where it's getting worse is unfortunately again in the center of the picture, it is Africa. Now, uh, there are two types of migration which can be observed in, uh, from in Africa. One is what I call the African iceberg. It is not the Northern Hemisphere. It means for every African migrant in Europe, there are nine who are moving in Africa between countries. Within countries, when, uh, for example, uh, in Elf, uh, Ivory Coast, the political instability came out. One million citizens of Mali left the country who were seasonal laborers there. One million people were absorbed <coughs> by 11 million Mali citizens back home. If this would happen in Europe, in this, it would mean we have to absorb 50 million migrants in a year. The substitute migrant, which is uh, uh, relatively long featured from Western Africa, when the big family puts together the money, uh, appoints one young male, and he is basically smuggled into Europe as an illegal worker to send home uh, 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 money to keep the fam big family there. This is illegal, 
but everybody profited from it. So therefore, it was tolerated. I say, if you open the Spanish uh, glass houses, you would find a lot of illegal agricultural laborers whose low wage is the reason why the Spanish tomato is cheaper in, in Hungary than the Hungarian. <laughs> okay. If you look into the world through potential water-related tipping points, uh, again, I don't go through all the points, but you see that most of them in the center around the equators and in the southern hemisphere. So uh, last year when I was first invited by IAS and uh, had the privilege to use Ferenc Mislivet's office because he was absent and there were no many opulent offices like right now, <laughs> there was a book uh, written by Russian scientists who said that this is the Arctic century exactly as Professor Geinfer said, because the northern hemisphere is heating up, so within 20-30 years, uh, northern Canada and Siberia will be our proper. It means, you can imagine, what will be the direction of the mass migration, and the question is, the Canadian army would shoot or the Russian army would shoot, but welcome to the Arctic century. What are at stake? Uh, if I am a little bit gloomy, not too gloomy, the future of the European Union is at stake. It could break up, and uh, uh, many people say that the decision of Angela Merkel in 2015, bypassing all European consultations, which is now he is, she is claiming she needs, uh, triggered the Brexit. Internal social coherence in Euro EU member states is definitely could be much better and or ability to feed the world. Europe could feed the world, but it is not doing and it's not prepared to do that. At least I don't see any change sign of it. Both uh, the potential source countries of migration and the receiving countries have to be very uh, concerned about sustainable economic growth or sustainable economies and cultural and national identities, not only in the receiving countries, also the countries who provide the refugees uh, or, or migrants. And it's an interesting thing that uh, when we talk about mass migration, take the country of Sweden, which is now a rich country receiving uh, migrants, giving a lot of uh, uh, humanitarian money. 120 years ago, this country lost one third of its population to migration to the United States and Canada. One third. Okay, so development is possible, but it takes at least 100 years. <coughs> in the source countries, there are two causes, development or disasters in Africa and in the middle. I am unfortunately knowing a little bit Africa and I'm unfortunately very much afraid that from the two Ds, the second D is more likely to realize than the first one. And the, politically from fragile states to failing states, this could be the consequence there. Uh, finally, I believe that the global peace and potential large-scale collapse cannot be ruled out. Now, at this point I have to say I'm an optimist. We shall muddle through, but how I cannot really tell. Thank you. <laughs>
uh, different components beginning to uh, work or uh, integrate collectively. Um, and that's really the theme of what I want to talk about. It also, in my mind, represents, uh, this is a good picture of what happened here in the last couple of weeks with the students. So we had uh, students of different backgrounds who learned to talk across their disciplines and across their nationalities. Uh, so I'm going to talk about this at a local level. And I'm, no, I'm not going <coughs> to. So I'd like to start with a, a kind of context for this notion of a circular economy and how it begins to very modestly address at a local level some of the some of the global problems that are on the table today. And I, I want to relate it in a way to the issue of migration, to the issue of climate change, um, by saying that the response has to be local. Um, and in a way, the last talk that we heard where we learned about population migration is, is not a strange concept. We are losing people from rural areas globally. And so, in a way, the project shaped here in Hussig is an attempt to say, what can we do in a rural area uh, to keep people and, and jobs in this area? So, um, I think this is fairly self-evident, but I want to talk about the basis of the circular economy, of course, is in uh, the natural systems and the relationships among these different parts. Um, and you'll notice that the arrows suggest flow. So what's very important, of course, is we have solar energy photosynthesis creating carbon stock in the trees, uh, enabling the trees to evapotranspire water to help the hydrologic cycle. Um, importantly, trees lose their leaves, they're, as they fall to the forest floor, but they perform a very important function of leaching nutrients into the soil. So if we want to think about this issue sorry, of uh, stock, we have stock and we have flows. I've just talked about uh, flows, but the stock are our trees and our soil. And in a way, that was something that we learned in these last three weeks here in Kusik. Our, our forests, our soil for agriculture. And I'll close with talking about the other stock that we have here in Jersey, namely that of the, the building fabrics, the historic fabrics. And I see those as important stocks. And the idea is to continue to replenish uh, the, the stocks um, as part of a regeneration. So um, what I want to show here are the difference between our, our kind of current uh, state of human-made urban systems, our infrastructure, uh, which follows more modern um, siloed uh, organization strategies where we don't understand the connections between different phenomena um, as opposed to natural uh, systems which are closed loop and circular flows. So our extractive economy, uh, economy versus a regenerative, um, basically fossil fuel dependent versus independent, and most importantly, um, we, we have to learn not to consume the global resources, but to work with what we have and replenish them as we consume them. So I've been interested in this topic as my research agenda of how our urban systems um, and many of these infrastructure systems from uh, wastewater treatment, for example, or a, a waste sorting facility, or uh, refueling of um, vehicles. These have actually interdependent opportunities, which we have really not taken adequate advantage of. And that's what I've, I've looked at examples from across the globe. I'll only have time to share a couple of very uh, uh, simple examples. but. This was the uh, compulsion or the, the, um, the thought behind doing this work here in Kusig is to show how we might do it at a very little scale. So briefly, in France, uh, in the city of Lille, the mayor determined that in order to reduce carbon uh, CO2 emissions from the city, he had to address this across his portfolio of city agencies. And he looked at wastewater 
and said, there is waste going on here. What can we extract that isn't being used? So he, he created a pilot, and you'll see this. Uh, picture. Okay, sorry. Right here um, on the upper left. Um, he created a pilot where he took the waste gas, a biomethane, from the wastewater, which was being wasted, and he turned it into a biofuel. Um, into a biogas for his buses. And that worked so well, he said, let's do the whole fleet this way. So where are we going to find more waste? So he looked at all of the organic waste uh, from restaurants, from domestic uh, waste, and agricultural <coughs> waste. And he said, let's collect that separately. We will uh, anaerobically digest that waste. Um, and we will pull off the biogas. We'll convert that into a fuel, and we'll fuel all our buses. And the waste from that product will go back to the fields as fertilizer. So this was a very important, I think, a breakthrough project, simply because he got the different agencies to talk to each other, transportation, uh, wastewater, and, and, <coughs> and the food sector. And when he did this, he also realized, I think, that we can save a lot of miles on our bus transport if we put the bus depot at the waste center uh, so that they could refuel there and they didn't have to expend miles elsewhere. So this is the kind of thinking we're, we're starting to see. So this is a very important example and I want to talk to this in essence because uh, if you can read the slide on the, on the top left this was a collaboration among private industry, uh, multiple universities, uh, the municipality uh, of, in, in the uh, community of Vestenkov on the island of Lalland in Denmark. Um, and they came together around a problem. Uh, the loss of employment from the, uh, the uh, they, lost, they lost the sea, uh, the shipping industry in this town. And they were looking, they were casting about for what could they do to rebuild the economy. And they lit upon the solution, which is next generation energy production. So very simply, uh, they recognized that in the North Sea, where all the wind farms are being put in place, there is today a surplus of wind energy at night uh, that is going to waste. And so they harvested that, and they said, let's take that excess energy. We will send it through an electrolyzer, and they will separate the water into oxygen and hydrogen. The oxygen they sent to speed up the waste water treatment, and the hydrogen they used in something called a fuel cell, which is a non-combustion, it's a chemical interaction that allows you to produce heat and hot water. So the town actually became uh, basically independent in its electricity. Um, I said heat and hot water. I meant electricity and hot water. The town became independent. And um, they looked at other uh, strategic ideas, which was to utilize some of the, the biologic waste um, that also <coughs> provided heat. And, eventually came around to uh, recognizing they had a surplus of sludge from the wastewater which could uh, be transformed into algae and the algae into bus fuel. So what we're looking at is this mentality of saying what's out there, what's available, what's underutilized, how can we service this and how can we use appropriate technology to make that change. So, on top of that, so that's one thing that I wanted to talk about. The other is that when we are talking about these infrastructure facilities, um, I think what we're learning is that they can be multi-purpose. They, they may perform their function. For example, this is a waste to energy plant in Japan. It's also a museum of garbage. And people pay to come see the garbage being sorted here. On the left, uh, this is a waste, uh, a stormwater treatment plant, which has become a public uh, fountain and a wastewater treatment in a public park. The, the, the water treatment plant is below, this is above. And these two represent uh, recent uh, efforts in um, 
creating public assets from water treatment facilities. So my, my point here is not only should we be looking to circularize the systems, uh, we should also be looking at their functionality and, and uh, making them double up. So here's just to answer one of the water uh, issues. Um, in the, the Middle East, the drying area, desiccated areas of Saudi Arabia, um, there was a wadi, which is a seasonal stream, which became highly polluted because guess why? The, uh, the Saudis were buying de de uh, desalinated water um, at a great rate and running it through their sewer system so the water table came up and the pollution flooded the river. So they had this beautiful wadi, which was then, on the, you can see on the left, is full of garbage. In essence, they came up with a solution that did uh, both clean the water and provide a restored asset to the town. And they did this using natural systems, something which we have proposed here in Kusi, uh, such as wetlands or bioremediation. Uh, to clean the water, and in essence, it's, I'm not going to go into the complex uh, sort of biochemical operations, but um, they used, uh, they introduced new um, uh, waterfalls and other kinds of um, undersurface to oxygenate the water, and that activated the microbes who then processed some of the waste in that stream. And then at the end, they, they sort of accelerated that process. They introduced um, plants and fish. And the plants took up the remaining nutrients in the fishing plants. And the water was great. And they could use it again for downstream irrigation. Whoops, I am not. Um, do I have time to talk about one or two other examples? Yeah. Five minutes. Five minutes. That, I'll do that. So. Uh, this is a project that I worked on with some students in New York City, where I was trying to replicate what was done in France by looking at what were the assets in this area. Here's a wastewater treatment plant. There is a, a, a bus fueling garage. So is there something we could do here? And could we build some new infrastructure, such as an organic waste facility, uh, processing facility? And that's what the students actually did. So they, they wanted to recover the methane that was currently wasted, and that would go to fuel the buses. Then they looked at what was coming out of the wastewater treatment plant, which is traditionally thrown away. It's called sludge. It has no use. It's usually sent somewhere else uh, to provide uh, land cover. And we, we decided we were going to think about using a solar drying, this would save enormous amounts of energy. And $8 million a year, the city wouldn't have to spend to have that sludge tree. And then we'd have this new organic waste facility that would then create more biogas um, so that we could run the, uh, the uh, bus depot. Um, and then the students started to couple other things. I was encouraging them to think what other uh, assets could we add to this equation? So we started to think about some of the uh, creating a greenhouse um, and uh, uh, basically they came up with new answers and then I gave it to the architecture students and this is what they did. And I wanted to show this simply because what they have created and this is under discussion with our uh, DEP and uh, uh, Department of Environmental Protection, uh, they, they were very excited to see this as a solution. The big object in, in the left is the solar sludge dryer. We have the organic waste operating, biodigesting the, the food waste. Community agriculture um, was one of the programs we introduced. We introduced a brewery and a, a, a restaurant and an outdoor <coughs> amphitheater. And all of the, these activities, most of these activities were underground and the park goes over it. So that at the end of the day, sorry, uh, what, what is experienced, <coughs> here are the greenhouses, here are the biodigesters, here's a community room, and then the landscape is a park and here are community gardens. So we're, 
combining the functionalities of these several different interlinked systems. And we're providing a public amenity. And so, in a way, a lot of that has informed what the students have done in Kursig. I'm not going to show this slide. Um, so this is why we're looking at circularizing the urban systems um, to regenerate natural systems, very, very important um, for um, responding to the changes of the Anthropocene, the climate change, uh, transitioning to renewable energy sources, and I, I think um, creating compatibility in terms of commerce and other public benefits. And I believe that the universities have a role to play wherever they are, and they're starting to be proactive with their municipalities in having visions. Um, so this is what we wanted to do here in Kursi. And here you see this team, they're all in the audience, um, and they worked nights and weekends um, to produce a plan, which I think you all saw, or if you, those of you who didn't, you really missed a great performance, I hear. Um, but uh, in quick summary, um, what we were trying to do, what they were trying to do, was to provide some closed loops in the economy. On the left, looking at the natural resources, the river, um, cleaning the river, and uh, improving the forestry practices. On the, on the right, looking at the current economy and, and saying, Something in the middle is going to be able to take advantage of these natural resources and combine it with the economy. And so that's what has evolved um, into a fairly specific plan. And here you can see many of these flows. I call these, uh, you know, this is the stock. Uh, historic, to say building stock, right? It's the same word. Um, and on the left uh, are the flows from um, sustainable forests, uh, <coughs> implementation of solar power and hydropower, and uh, sustainably harvested materials that would be transformed in this eco-industrial, uh, eco-innovation park, if you will, into new products, sustainable products. Importantly, harvesting um, much of the food waste, the agro waste, and even pig waste to produce green energy and putting in the, the, the missing pieces, this brewery bakery where you have uh, CO2 you can take out from the bakery and send it to the greenhouse. And so what uh, the students have developed is a solution that looks at existing building stock here in Kosi, underutilized. This is the existing felt factory. This is uh, just being, uh, it's storing uh, materials and goods and not being uh, well purposed. So the idea was to create a series of new uses, an eco incubator and workshops, which I'll talk to in the end, the bakery and the brewery, which have this wonderful synergy. Um, looking at, at the uh, treatment of the, the river, you don't see the constructed wetland off here. And uh, putting in um, new event space, particularly for teenagers, a farmer's market, and a greenhouse. So this is uh, being layered on top, and then here we have uh, the return of microhydro power, just simply units that are dropped into the Genghis River. Um, we have rainwater harvesting, um, vegetated roofs, rooftop solar, all the good practices that we want to put in on, the, on display um, in this program. And make this a centerpiece for how other communities throughout Hungary or in the region in general, in, in Europe for that matter, Central Europe in particular, and Eastern Europe, how this could roll out. So with that, I think that's my last slide. And yes, I didn't show a proper image of this. I don't know why it didn't come. So thank you very much. And I, I can give you the possibility to ask questions or go.